My name is Mark Odland, and I'm a member of the organizing committee for the South Haven Speaker Series. Tonight's event is the fourth and the final presentation of the South Haven Speaker Series inaugural year and represents the culmination of the vision and planning that began just a few short months ago. <clears throat> it was a cold and snowy day on February 2nd, 2015, when a small group of South Haven citizens, it was a very small group, those who didn't go south for the winter, <laughs> to warmer climates, huddled together in the loft at Cafe Julia to brainstorm, develop our mission and envision the South Haven Speaker Series. We talked about a mission that focused on inspiration and intellectual stimulation for interested members of the community and finally settled on the idea that our work would center on issues, innovations, and ideas shaping our lives. We've worked hard to stay focused on that mission through the first three presentations. Our first speaker was Peter Annan, author of The Great Lakes Water Wars, who presented a compelling story on the need for vigilance in protecting the Great Lakes from water diversions outside the watershed. That presentation was to a sold out audience at Lake Michigan College. Peter was followed uh, by Jamie Orlikoff, an internationally known healthcare expert who spoke on the issues and challenges facing the healthcare delivery system in the United States today. Our third speaker was our South Haven native, Marcy Russell McCarthy, an economist and former co-author, anchor of the Squawk Box from CNBC. She presented the case for economic optimism. And tonight, we maintain our mission by bringing yet another inspiring speaker to South Haven. Tonight's speaker is United States Attorney for the Western District of Michigan, Patrick Miles. Patrick was appointed to this position by President Barack Obama, and he was confirmed as the U.S. Attorney in 2012. He is a native of Michigan, having grown up in Grand Rapids. He earned a bachelor's degree from Aquinas College and went on to graduate from Harvard Law School in 1991. He practiced law for 21 years, served as president of the Grand Rapids Bar Association, and ran for Congress in 2010 prior to his appointment as U.S. Attorney. Just a quick note. This afternoon, uh, Patrick uh, spoke to a packed house here of, Mich of uh, South Haven High School students. And I haven't been around high school students uh, in that large a number for a long time. But folks, I got to tell you, he moved that audience this afternoon. And uh, it was so impressive to see uh, how encouraged and how visionary he was to them. So please join me in welcoming Patrick Miles. What I'm going to talk about is, a little, is uh, and you may not be as familiar with the work of the U.S. Attorney's Office here in West Michigan. Uh, I'll talk to you about that, describe what, uh, the types of cases we handle and the work we do, uh, as well as uh, now some of the things, uh, the relationship uh, between communities and law enforcement, and we've seen around our country some of the breakdown, unfortunately, of that, and, and some things that I'm hoping uh, that we're doing in West Michigan uh, so that we don't have any of those negative uh, types of events. Um, when I, I came to the U.S. Attorney's Office, uh, as, as you heard, uh, from private practice, and so most U.S. Attorneys, uh, well, I should say about roughly half, there's 93 U.S. Attorneys uh, in the United States. Uh, some states have one, some states have two, some states have four. Uh, and also you have the territories uh, like Puerto Rico and Guam and the Virgin Islands and D.C. So there's 93 U.S. attorneys in, in, in our, our districts. Uh, and some are career prosecutors. They come up from the office and some come in from the outside. One thing uh, that really has impressed me when I joined the office coming from private law practice is just the quality of attorneys uh, and prosecutors that we get in our office. The applica applications we get are just amazing. And we also get fantastic support staff position uh, applications as well, because uh, it really is an honor 
uh, to stand up in court and say, I represent uh, the United States of America and the people. So know that you're getting just top-notch quality uh, that, are, that are working for you. Uh, our, our Western District is, is actually a very uh, unique district. I think we have a little bit of everything. It's geographically, and I'll use my Michigan map, it's right down the spine of the state. So it's everything, including Lansing, so Ingham County, everything there west, plus all of the Upper Peninsula. So that's 49 counties out of our 83 counties in Michigan, 49 counties. It's about uh, three and a half million people in population. It's 35,000 square miles of, so I'm putting a lot of miles on my Buick driving around uh, the district and, and the Upper Peninsula. We've got large cities like Grand Rapids and Lansing and Kalamazoo, Battle Creek. Uh, we have cities that have incredible uh, violence problems uh, like those cities as well as Muskegon, Muskegon Heights and Benton Harbor. Uh, and we have incredibly rural areas. I mean, you can't get much more rural than, than the Western Upper Peninsula. Uh, our main office is in Grand Rapids. We have 38 attorneys, uh, but uh, we have three attorneys in Marquette. We have a Marquette office that handles our northern division, which is above the bridge uh, in the Upper Peninsula. We also have an office in Lansing, and there's currently, we have a staff person there, but we don't have an attorney, uh, because right now there's not a, a district court, federal district court judge in Lansing. Uh, most of the judges right now are in Grand Rapids and in Marquette, although Judge Maloney, are, who was our chief judge, he has, he, we have a, court, a federal courthouse in Kalamazoo as well. Uh, so we have the state capitol, we've got major universities like Michigan State and Western Michigan, and uh, we have 11 federally recognized Native American tribes. That is the most of any uh, federal district uh, east of the Mississippi. So we have a lot of Native American tribes, five are in the Upper Peninsula, six are below the bridge, uh, and essentially uh, we have, a, have to maintain uh, a good relationship with those tribes because those are sovereign nations. And, when, and so the state of Michigan has no jurisdiction on tribal land. So the tribes themselves have a police force. They have their own court. Uh, they have their own councils. But when they have cases that involve serious felonies or non-native individuals who commit crimes on their land, that is us, that's federal for prosecution. So the FBI is investigating and uh, for uh, felonies, which is more than a year in prison, that those are federal cases. So a lot of times we're doing cases that normally aren't federal. We, we might be doing a domestic violence case where it's a non-native uh, man abusing a Native American uh, woman on tribal land. So we, really have to maintain a good relationship with, their, with, with those tribes. They have their own prosecutors, they have their own judges, their police force, like I mentioned, but we are handling a lot of their cases, and uh, a lot of them are domestic violence, a lot of them are child violence and, and, and drugs and so forth. So I meet with each of the tribes at least once a year uh, and consult with them and talk to them about our relationship. Uh, we have three national forests. Uh, which again are federal uh, lands and federal enclaves. So we might, in our misdemeanor docket, someone uh, from whether it's a speeding ticket or bringing a small amount of, of drugs into a national forest, that's going to be uh, uh, our office handling that prosecution. Uh, what was interesting, uh, we have a couple of nuclear power plants as well that we are concerned about, of course, from a, a national security standpoint. Uh, what is interesting is that actually two thirds of our case uh, cases. Uh, our civil cases, not criminal. Even though most of our attorneys are in our uh, criminal division, uh, we have about six in our civil division. Uh, so these are high volume cases that they typically don't take a lot of time unless they're things like uh, when the US government is being sued, like someone, um, even a motor uh, car accident with a, with a federal truck, like a post postal truck or something or a vehicle. Uh, or a medical malpractice claim against a veterans hospital or, or a federal health clinic. Uh, we might be defending those types of tort actions. So we have a lot of civil cases, uh, social security type cases uh, and, and the like. And bankruptcy, when someone goes into bankruptcy and the federal government's a creditor. So we do have civil cases as well. I mean, the ones that get headlines, of course, are mostly gonna be our criminal cases. Uh, a lot of times our civil cases we will pursue civil penalties along with a criminal a case, or sometimes we might pursue civil penalties and fines, uh, like in the environmental area or some others. 
uh, instead of, in lieu of, doing criminal prosecutions. But for the most part, criminal uh, does get a lot of our uh, attention and most of our resources. And just to kind of give you a, a breakdown of, of, of some of the cases that we handle, uh, immigration, believe it or not, is actually our biggest uh, percentage. 28% of our cases are immigration cases, which are uh, reentry cases, people who've uh, been deported, uh, have come back, which itself is a crime, and maybe they've also committed another crime while they're here. Uh, those actually are, are, like I said, over 25%, 28% of our caseload. And that's actually true nationally for U.S. Attorney's Offices of the Department of Justice. Uh, for many years, uh, these immigration reentry cases are the vast majority, uh, not the vast majority, but almost a majority. They're 42% of the cases that are being handled. So we're a little bit here in, in Michigan, a little bit below the national average, but uh, the border states in the southwest and south uh, are certainly handling a lot of those cases. It's 68,000 cases a year. Uh, now, this is, again, these are criminal federal prosecutions, different than some of the, Im the administrative and uh, just straightforward deportation cases that would go through a different type of uh, system. But it just shows you the, the complexity and the vastness of this issue. When you talk about having 11 or 12 million undocumented aliens here in the United States, and this is already getting so much attention, and yet that's 68,000 cases nationally uh, that, are, that, are, that are handling it, and that's, that's still uh, you know, almost half of, of our caseload. Uh, major narcotics cases, the drug trafficking cases, are about 20% of our cases. Violent crime cases and, and firearms, that'd be everything from bank robberies to gang violence uh, to people who are in, uh, felons uh, who are in possession of, of firearms, which they're not allowed to do. Uh, those are about 25% of our cases. And white collar and, and, and fraud type cases, financial fraud cases, are about 23% of our caseload. Uh, we handle in our office, we have about over 300 indictments a year and, and informations which are, uh, indictments you go through a grand jury process. Uh, the, the informations are ones where there's more uh, urgency and you go directly to arrest and arraignment. Uh, there's about 40 to 60 of those. So we have about 350 uh, defendants uh, that we're prosecuting in a given year. And our office is in trial uh, on average two times a month. When you work for a big law firm like I did, a uh, big corporate law firm, uh, there's lawyers that you that may not see a trial uh, once a year. Uh, and we're, we're, in, we're in court quite frequently and we're in trial about every other week. When I became a uh, U.S. attorney in the middle of 2012, in June of 2012, one thing I noticed about, about our office, uh, the office is, is now, like I said, 37, 38 attorneys. And the office, up until about 1980, only had five or six attorneys total. So those attorneys had to be, those AUSAs had to be jack of all trades uh, and doing every type of case, all the cases I just mentioned. Uh, but now, as the, the office grew quite a bit uh, in the 80s and early 90s, particularly under uh, former U.S. Attorney John Smetanka, who was from Berrien County. He was U.S. Attorney for 12 years during the two Reagan uh, terms and then, and then uh, George Herbert Walker Bush. Uh, the office grew to about 30 uh, or so AUSAs in those 12 years. And that coincided with, with the increase in federal uh, criminal uh, statutes and the war on drugs and the like. But what I saw was, was that the office um, really was becoming, the attorneys needed to become more specialized in these areas. They, you know, and that's where the law has been moving for se several years, especially in, in the private sector. And so we, what I did was I, I wanted our attorneys to, to be specialized and our support staff to be specialized. So they're seeing the same cases over and over and getting really, really good at them and knowing the ins and outs of not just the facts, but also the laws. And I, the other thing I wanted to see is our attorneys be more proactive in developing cases from the beginning, not getting involved at the back end, but really working with law enforcement in terms of developing the case, making sure the evidence uh, is gathered properly so we don't have constitutional challenges later on uh, from defense counsel, and really having vertical prosecutions uh, from the grounds up, you know, shaping uh, the facts and the and, and law within the law to make sure we had better cases. And so we, I wanted a more, ta what I, our proactive approach is a more task force approach. And those task forces are also used to actually prevent crimes and educate people and the public uh, so we don't have crimes uh, occurring at the same point. Uh, so our criminal division, 
now has four sections, uh, our organized drug crime section, our violent crime section, uh, our financial crime section, and our national security section. And in that organized drug crime section, uh, we have units which are more reactive cases uh, that we're going to take no matter what, and our task forces, which again are more proactive. So we have our major narcotics unit and organized crime and drug enforcement task force, uh, which again is attacking some of those uh, drug cartels and the drug trafficking. Drug diversion and prescription fraud task force, uh, which is a new one that I created, and I'm going to talk more about prescription uh, drugs and drug, the diversion of, of drugs. Asset forfeiture and financial litigation unit, uh, one of the things we did do, and, and, the, and you know, there's a lot of bad stories out there about asset forfeiture, uh, the government taking people's assets without a trial and, and their property and, and just because they've been alleged to have committed a crime. Uh, most of those uh, horror stories you hear are occurring at the state uh, and local level. Really the federal, we have a much different standards by when we uh, use uh, asset forfeiture to really attack the proceeds of crimes, particularly drug crimes. So we actually wanted, and one thing I did do is, is we, whenever there's uh, a, a criminal indictment, especially in a drug crime, we're going to try and go after those assets uh, as a default unless there's a reason not to. But again, we're not looking at just taking, you know, gym shoes and, and there was, I guess we're all adults here. There was one woman who testified in Lansing about a, a you know, a, a feminine a device and that was seized. I mean, we're, we're looking at cash, we're looking at, you know, assets that the U.S. Marshals could end up, you know, turning around and, and uh, trying to, uh, you know, get some value out of that are really go, are the proceeds and then go back and return to victims and, and others. Uh, in our violent crime section, uh, we have what's called our Project Safe Childhood Unit, which addresses ch uh, child exploitation. And a lot of that, what we are doing in that regard is internet uh, child pornography. Uh, it's, it's very prevalent. Uh, I was very surprised to see how widespread that is, I think, and, and also how depraved, frankly, uh, some of the people that are engaged in that behavior uh, uh, are. And so uh, the production and distribution and the trafficking of child pornography with the internet has really, really grown quite a bit. Uh, one thing that we're also looking at in this regard is, is uh, child uh, sex trafficking. And we are really cracking down hard on uh, people who are turning uh, vulnerable young girls in particular, you know, sometimes they're runaways, sometimes they just have trouble at home, uh, getting into drugs, uh, pretending to be their boyfriend, but they end up becoming their pimp and, and pimping them out for, for money uh, in the commercial sex trade. And, and so when they do that for minors, especially when they use force, fraud, or coercion, uh, we can make it a federal case and, and hit really hard with some sentences. So we're really taking uh, those cases uh, to heart. We had our first child sex trafficking case in this Western District. Uh, the case began two years ago, but the conviction was last year, Eddie Jackson, and, and since then we've had two or three more, and there's going to be more, unfortunately, until we get, we're going to get the message out uh, that you will face federal penalties if you engage, if you start to try and uh, turn, you know, young girls, teenagers, uh, minors, uh, in, into uh, commercial sex workers. And uh, what, what has been a concern nationwide is uh, drugs, uh, gangs who have been engaged in drug trade, uh, they've known, just like the mafia knows, that you could face federal prosecution. And so for many, so then many of them, business thinking, well, the risk is very high there, the reward is, you know, whatever it is, but over here, I might, if I start getting into the, the, the sex, commercial sex business, I may not face federal prosecution, I'll only state, face state charges, and those tend to be lower, and you may not serve all your time, and so there's lower risk, so we'll get into the, the prostitution business, and we're going to send the message, no, you could even be in jeopardy of federal prosecution if you get into that trade, and if you're trying to migrate out of your, uh, your drug trade. Uh, in the violent crimes, we also, like I mentioned, we, ha we handle bank robberies and firearms, uh, we have that unit and our Project Safe Neighborhood Task Force, which is to address uh, gangs and, and violent groups. Uh, the urban areas of Grand Rapids, Lansing, Kalamazoo, Battle Creek, Muskegon, and Benton Harbor, we formed violent crime task forces where instead of just taking 
federal cases just because we could and you know everyone gets a st statistic because it's an easy conviction. Uh, I really wanted us to be more effective and say really talking to the local police who know who the troublemakers are and sometimes the troublemakers aren't the people with the worst record. That's what, you know, we, we normally would take the people with the worst record. They would go federal just because, and then we could get them like a felon in possession of a firearm and we'd they could take them federal. But sometimes the worst people in the community who are really the troublemakers, the community is so afraid of them that they actually may not have, may not even have an arrest. They may, may not have anything significant because they're, they're, everyone's so terrorized and terrified of, of testifying against them. But those are the types of individuals that really are the cancer around the neighborhoods. And so we're, we're working with local law enforcement to really try and uh, address those worst offenders and when we can, give them the federal sentences to get them out of the community for a long period of time because they are really the cause of, of the problem and the violent crime problem uh, in those cities. So those task forces are working very effectively together. And one thing in West Michigan we do is we do work really well, really well together. One thing I was, you know, you watch movies and you, depending on the TV show or the movie, uh, you know, if it's if it's a TV show like Miami Vice, you know, the local police are, are really smart, they're really savvy, they're really good, and the, the, the feds are the, you know, the FBI and the DEA, they're the bumbling idiots that come in and screw up cases. And, and if, or, if, or if the hero in the movie is, is a federal agent, it's the local people, the, the local police that are the local yokels and they don't know what they're doing and they're you know, off base and screwing up. And there's always these turf battles on, that the media portrays. We don't have that here in West Michigan, thankfully, because I'm the arbiter of those as the U.S. Attorney. We really do work well. The local police departments, the sheriff's departments, the Michigan State Police, our law enforcement partners and the FBI, the DEA, the Secret Service, uh, the ATF, the Homeland Securities, we really are good at working together and, and it's really not about who's getting the credit and who can get the glory. It's really about doing the job and getting it done. So I'm really pleased uh, to see that and that it's working well and I'm really pushing hard on those collaborations. Uh, I mentioned our Indian country uh, work and we have an Indian country unit in our northern division, uh, the UP, even though it's only five uh, tribes, that's about 60% of our cases because you have some very big tribes up there like the Sault Ste. Marie tribe. Uh, and our southern division is, is six tribes. In, and uh, our Marquette branch is also part of uh, that unit. In our financial crime section, we have a bankruptcy fraud unit. We have people uh, who occasionally in the bankruptcy process w will hide, try and hide assets or keep them from the court. And so we will uh, get referrals that will prosecute people for bankruptcy fraud. Uh, we also, of course, handle investment. We have an investment and bank fraud unit. In this district, we see a lot of Ponzi schemes. Uh, we see just a tremendous amount of, of people running Ponzi schemes. And, and uh, seniors are often the victims of those uh, because they have substantial savings. Uh, a lot of these are affinity frauds where people are using their relationships at church uh, or charities or financial advisors and taking advantage of people's trust based on those uh, to get them into these uh, can't miss investments, 10%, 15%, 20% guaranteed return every year. Doesn't happen in real life. I mean, those the, we just see so many of those Ponzi schemes. Um, um, and then, you know, some of the other frauds are the ones that you probably see and hear about the, the advanced fee schemes. You know, the Nigerian prince who just inherited $100 million or, uh, you know, is entitled to a bunch of government money because their fa his father was uh, was a minister or something in the in the government and 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 you could I, because you're such a good person and, and I know you're a, a person of faith or what have you I, I want to give this money to you uh, then if you inquire further yeah, to get this money out of Nigeria uh, we're gonna need I need five thousand dollars to pay the taxes or to pay whatever uh, so wire me the five thousand dollars and you're not gonna see that five thousand dollars again and you're not gonna see your sixty million sorry. Uh, and so, and, and you know, by the way, you've also probably given up your bank account information along the way, and your bank account will probably be cleared out. So these, that's an old scam. Uh, there was one that um, with Facebook and social media, uh, where people put a lot of information. You know, not just when they're going on vacation. Hey, I'm I'm going uh, to uh, to Hawaii for two weeks. You basically just say, Hey, I'm going. Uh, I'm leaving my house. You know, rob me. You know, and, and so. But the other one is, uh, you know, your kids and grandkids are saying, I'm on spring break. And so uh, my secretary, not at 
this office, but at my private law firm, uh, she, she, she had a granddaughter and got a call from this person and said, I'm a friend of your granddaughter, Gina, and we're in Vegas, and she got arrested, and she needs $2,000 to bail her out. And fortunately, this, this grandmother was, you know, she kind of knew. She's like, yeah. So she calls her, the, her daughter, the mother, and said, you know, is Gina in Vegas? Or is she in jail? No, no, I just talked to Gina. You know, okay, so it was a scam. So, but, you know, people try and, those scam, scam artists, they use a little bit of information, you know, to get your trust, cons, right? Confidence, and to get your confidence, because they know a little bit of something because of social media. Um, and, and we've also seen, uh, unfortunately, sometimes uh, bank tellers and bank officers are embezzling CDs because a lot of seniors and people have, have CDs that come up for renewal and you lose track. I don't know how many CDs I have. I've lost track. But, you know, the, so you forget about them and then somebody cashes them out and never, you, know, you didn't know that your CD has been cashed out and taken. So we sometimes will see those cases. Um, and, you know, but I will say, banks are still safer than putting your money in a mattress, okay, or in, in a shoebox. Uh, so I'm, I don't, I'm not here to say banks are untrustworthy. Uh, please don't take that message. But, um, but just, you know, look at those bank statements and pay attention to your, to your holdings and your assets. Um, and now, of course, you know, the, the manipulation of the caller ID, which is saying, people saying, I'm calling from the IRS, uh, you owe... Uh, back taxes, and if you don't pay it, you're going to go to jail. I'm going to send the sheriff out to jail you. The IRS does not call. The IRS sends letters, uh, and they're not going to ask for your Social Security number. They probably already have it. So don't give out your Social Security number, and don't believe the caller ID. If, if you know, just be skeptical and, 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 and question and, and hang up, you know, in those situations. Don't, don't trust the technology of the caller ID. It's not always, uh, people aren't always who they say they are. We have a government program fraud unit, so we do see uh, people, you know, taking advantage of some of the the, the welfare and the, um, the 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 SNAP programs and some of the other programs, uh, and uh, and so we prosecute those cases. Uh, we have a tax fraud unit uh, that prosecutes people who are tax protesters, people who don't believe that they have to pay taxes because of some. Uh, sovereignty argument, uh, uh, or just they don't think taxes are constitutional, uh, and unfortunately they're wrong, and 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 they do have to pay their taxes, and so we do uh, prosecute those, as well as tax cheats, of course, too. We have a lot of tax cheats, or the people that are uh, engaging, you know, filing for false refunds. Um, we have a, I created a, an environmental task force uh, to to work with the EPA, investigative uh, agencies. Uh, looking at asbestos and hazardous waste and water and air uh, violations. Uh, we have a healthcare fraud task force. This is a big area, healthcare fraud. Uh, and we also not only, we not only go after that area both criminally but also civilly with uh, affirmative civil enforcement, looking at penalties and uh, so, in sometimes looking at the licensing and, and, and getting uh, bad providers and physicians uh, removed from uh, being eligible for Medicare reimbursement, and then also usually the private insurers will follow. So that's basically a, a, a essentially a death sentence for a provider who can't get reimbursed uh, from insurance providers. So that's a huge uh, penalty for them when they when they're uh, found to be uh, violating uh, those policies. Um, free equipment offers are often sources of frauds uh, because. They'll say, hey, this is free equipment, but then they're going to go ahead and charge the insurance company, uh, and then sometimes the equipment isn't even needed or not delivered. Um, sometimes we, we see people uh, offering unnecessary or fake tests uh, at shopping malls even, or retirement homes or health clubs, uh, and, and they say, oh, these are free, and then they're billing your insurance uh, for it, or their Medi or Mal Medicare, so that, that's a fraud that we see. Um, being a savvy consumer is, is necessary in today's day and age uh, because a lot of times there can be uh, unnecessary or repetitive procedures or services and if, you know, where uh, you're getting these procedures multiple times on different days and it just doesn't seem right, doesn't seem necessary. That might be a problem. You might want to report that uh, to uh, the insurance company or to some of the uh, state authorities uh, that it just doesn't seem right. Um, Looking at your statement of services, you can see 
And sometimes, if it's a bad provider, they might be billing for services that were never performed. You can say, you know, I never did have that service performed on me when I made that visit. That's a problem. That could be a healthcare fraud that's going on. Um, there's also Medicare fraud, of course. Uh, so a lot of times, one advice we give is never sign a blank insurance claim form. If someone hands you a, a blank insurance claim form and then you sign it, now they're, it's carte blanche. It's a blank check for them. Um, never give blanket author authorization to a medical provider for services rendered. I mean, just, you know, again, being a good consumer can help save the taxpayers and the public money. Um, ask your medical providers what they're going to charge and what you're expected to pay out of pocket and what they're going to bill to insurance. <coughs> because again, this is a problem where, you know, the, the consumer being divorced from the payer, the insurance provider. So sometimes, you know, they, they the, the, the unscrupulous people feed on that, that the patient really doesn't care because I'm not paying for it, you know, and so you don't really pay attention to what's being done. Um, because, and it's illegal for them to waive a copay and say you're getting a free service because um, then you don't care. You know, if you're not paying a copay, what do I care? It's illegal to, to, for, for them to waive that copay. Uh, and certainly don't do business with door to door or telephone salespeople who tell you that their services or equipment, medical equipment, are free because uh, they, just, they just flat out are not. Um, excuse me, I'm very dry up here. Um, you know, and give your insurance and Medicare information only uh, to those who provided you with medical services. You know, that's, that's really private information, and so you have to be really careful with it and protect it. Um, we have a new mortgage fraud task force, which is looking at people making false statements to get mortgages, uh, and they are harming borrowers and other neighbors because they can hurt the price value uh, of homes in your neighborhood and drive up costs. Um, we're looking at predatory refinancing schemes and people charging higher interest rates and fees, unscrupulous reverse mortgage originators, um, you know, which end up foreclosing and then buying your house and flipping it for a profit. Um, so these are the types of things that are going on out there. Uh, we have a new official corruption task force, which is looking at police misconduct uh, to elected officials. Uh, thankfully, we don't have a lot of that in our district, um, but it is always possible. Uh, we have a new suspicious activity report task force, which, which reviews uh, suspicious uh, bank transactions. Uh, and we, re we review those reports to see if something's going on that looks like it might be money laundering or those types of things. In our national security section, uh, that handles the immigration, removal, and reentry cases I mentioned. Uh, it's also, we also have an anti-terrorism task force, both domestic and, and foreign. Uh, we have a new identity theft and cybercrime task force. This is a growing area cyber attacks, intellectual property theft, credit card account takeovers, um, you know, and, and people who are using, you know, stolen in, uh, identity thefts for uh, tax refunds, SERFs, stolen identity fraud, uh, and so uh, those, are, those are issues that we're seeing more and more uh, common. We have a, a new criminal civil rights violations task force looking at human trafficking, tough cases to make. Uh, you know, wherever there's an inter interstate highway or hotel or convention centers, there's probably human traffic go going on, whether it's labor or adult uh, prostitution. Uh, and so those victims don't want to come forward. They're afraid, especially if they're foreign. They don't, they're afraid of, of, of being deported. They're afraid of authorities. You know, in their country, the, 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 the police are maybe corrupt. So they don't want to be uh, wit victim, uh, witnesses. And and they, they, move, they get moved around. So these are very hard cases. We really are trying to reach out to hotel workers and clerks to help identify these and report them uh, on, on the ground. Um, I talked about our, our civil division, the kind of cases we do there. And um, we also um, do a lot of work uh, in terms of all of these uh, types of task forces used with outreach. And, and I get my AUSAs out there to the public talking to industry groups in, in the healthcare area, for example, how to, how to you know, for whether it's physical therapists or provider groups or nursing groups, how to spot frauds, so how to not get in trouble, uh, and, and uh, how to report. Uh, since 2009, the Attorney General, the Department of Justice, our prior, there's been five main priorities. Uh, number one was national security. 
anti-terrorism. Uh, that's the world we live in. And securing our borders. Believe it or not, you know, contrary to what a lot of presidential candidates say, securing our borders has been, for the last six years, a priority of the Department of Justice. Prosecuting and reducing violent crime, prosecuting health care and financial frauds, and protecting the vulnerable, child, you know, child exportation cases, seniors, and civil rights. Uh, these track pretty much the, the priorities that I've had, as well as uh, you know, putting focus on the health care frauds, uh, putting focus on the child exploitation cases, and on heroin and prescription drugs. Uh, prescription drug uh, abuse is going up. A lot of doctors uh, are, are good doctors and medically necessary to prescribe painkillers such as oxycodone and oxycontin. But when they're overprescribed or being prescribed beyond what is medically necessary, that actually can be a crime. Uh, but for the most part, though, we're not looking at good doctors. We're looking at doctors who actually are in the, in the they're drug pushers. They're, they're, they really are trying to make money by, by selling Oxycontin and Oxycodone uh, with no medically necessary reason. And, and what the problem with those pills and when they're in your medicine cabinet is when people get addicted to them or, and teenagers get into your medicine cabinet and take them and then they run out and those pills are $60 a piece, they turn to heroin, which is the same opioid high that you have from the Oxys. And heroin is a lot cheaper, but it doesn't have any quality control consistency. And that's why you're seeing nationwide and in certain pockets overdoses. And heroin is getting mixed with fentanyl, which is an incredibly lethal combination. So you're seeing heroin deaths, overdose deaths on the rise. So that's one reason why Attorney General Holder had called for getting local police to get the medicine that can, can prevent a her an overdose death immediately uh, and getting that into the hands of first responders. But we really are trying to get the message out on this risk because it's hitting a lot of suburbs and rural areas, uh, and it's 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 become an epidemic, frankly, uh, the prescription drug abuse. So uh, that's why we're seeing a resurgence of, of heroin. It's you know in in the old days, you know it was you know the corner uh, street corner intravenous drug user and people who never thought that that would become them. It's happening across all economic lines. Um, Another priority uh, I mentioned, our violent crime task forces in those cities, you know, was really looking at uh, and providing some resources bolstering uh, local efforts uh, to reduce crime. And then finally, supporting prisoner reentry programs, um, because this is just to me common sense. Uh, it, made no, it makes no sense that nationally two-thirds of ex-offenders are back in the criminal justice system within two years of their release, two-thirds. Now, federally, that's 40 percent, a little better. Michigan actually is not so bad on this. It's 30 percent. One out of three is back within the criminal justice system within three years. So we're doing great, but, but not, obviously, too many, right? Because every time, if you have one out of three, that's another victim, another crime, another victim, more resources for police to catch them for people to be prosecuted and go back through and in, we spend as taxpayers 30 on average thirty thousand dollars a year to incarcerate and these folks are just on a circle so we're working really hard so that these folks don't re-offend once they've been released and so I started a program called facing choices where we go out I go out with the local chief of police with the local sheriff with the local prosecutor uh, and with people from the Michigan Department of Corrections, we talk to about 50 or 60 parolees at a time, and we give them a tough love message. You know, next time you screw up, you're going federal, or you could go federal, and you're sent out of state, and you're not going to get visited, uh, and, and you're on our radar. Uh, but also, they hear from ex-offenders themselves who've turned their lives around and saying, I've been where you are, and you can do it. You can make it. You need to make the choices. You've got to stop lying to yourself and, and others. You, you know, the manipulations are over. You, and then here are the resources. We give them resources for, for housing, uh, for transportation, for job opportunities, for training, so that it's, they have a chance. Uh, Reentry is a multifaceted problem. A lot of prisoners have substance abuse issues, uh, behavioral issues, uh, lack of job skills, lack of education, lack of, lack of transportation, um, it just, just a lot of uh, hurdles and obstacles to overcome. But if we just, as a, as a community, give up, and want to turn our backs on, on, on these citizens who are returning to our society, we are really being short-sighted. 
because we're, we could be the, their next victim if, if they screw up again. And we certainly are paying for their screw ups. Uh, so it's something that just makes sense to me to try and reduce the rate of recidivism. Uh, and there is a, there has been, in our district, we were one of the first in the country to have a, a, a reentry court, the accelerated, accelerated Community Entry Court. It's in Kalamazoo now. Uh, where they work with the highest risk of the people with the highest risk of, of reoffending, uh, monitor them closely, put them through behavioral therapy, and 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 give them some incentives and rewards, and also uh, disincentives if they screw up, uh, so they might be eligible for shortening the time of supervised release from federal prison. So the ACE program uh, is one that that's trying to address that, and, and something that that I very much support. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, we interact with law enforcement. We interact with a variety of different law enforcement, the, the federal agencies, the state police, the local police, the sheriff's departments, uh, the Native American police departments. Uh, we also interact, of course, with the Arab Muslim community, the African American community, the Latino community, the immigrant community. Uh, and so we interact with, as U.S. Attorney, I interact with a lot of different people and a lot of different jobs. And I see all the commonalities. Uh, whether it's people in the community uh, and in neighborhoods, they share exactly the same goals that we do in law enforcement. They want and they want justice. They want safety. They want security. They want peace in their neighborhoods. They want their neighborhoods to be free of violence, to be free of drugs, uh, illegal drugs. They want to be uh, free of organized crime and gangs and, 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 and free of fraud. They don't want to see human trafficking or sex trafficking going on. They don't want to see people's rights violated. They don't want to see children exploited. So you've got their goals as being exactly the same as law enforcement. But unfortunately, they're at odds. Communities, neighborhoods, and law enforcement seem to be at odds. There's a lot of tension. And so I've given a lot of thought over the past couple of years, why is that? Well, number one, it's a lack of communication. There isn't enough communication between law enforcement and communities going on. What comes out of communication? A relationship. And, and, and then if you develop a relationship, you can help bridge those gaps. And what comes out of a relationship? A trust. And so you can, if you build trust between those different communities of law enforcement and the communities they serve, then you won't have that same tension and you won't see those, the explosions that we've seen around the country in some of our cities. So communication, relationship, trust. Trust comes, and, and those things come from these understandings that can come out of these relationships. Uh, so I've been very supportive. When I became U.S. Attorney, about a, I learned about this group called ALPAC, Advocates and Leaders for Police and Community Trust. It had been going on in the Detroit area for about a dozen years. They had just started one in Grand Rapids, maybe just a couple months. I agreed to co-chair the Grand Rapids chapter, where it's a gathering of law enforcement representatives from all levels and community, a variety of community representatives, 50-50, meeting regularly, talking about issues in a confidential closed environment, not open to the media, no holds barred, you know, let's, let's have it out, let's be frank. And we started a new LPAC chapter, Southwest, in, in, in Benton Harbor uh, in 2014. And I know some other communities are considering uh, starting one as well. Holland is having one. So we sit down and discuss these issues. Uh, you know, whether it's how, because for example, in Grand Rapids we had a session where we talked about uh, the Hispanic community. And they had a lot of myths about the way uh, ICE, Immigration Customs Enforcement, did business. There was a misperception that ICE would do these uh, periodic um, sweeps, neighborhood sweeps. So just come into a neighborhood, decide this, okay, we're going to go into this neighborhood, we're just going to deploy a bunch of agents and task force officers, we're going to let the dogs loose, and we're just going to do random stop and, and searches, door to door. The, and so we had a session on that. The, and the representatives from ICE were there, the supervisors, and they said, we don't do that. That is not at all how we do business. That was the perception of the Hispanic community, but they're hearing from the horse's mouth that that's not the way we do. They say we do targeted, we, look, we, we know who we're looking for and we're going after them. What you are seeing are bounty hunters doing that. 
and they look and dress like ICE agents, except for one thing. ICE agents wear usually a badge or a big vest, blue vest, which in big letters, yellow letters, says ICE on the back. But these bounty hunters will kind of portray themselves to be federal agents, but they're not. And so that, that misperception was, was really helpful to get that addressed, hearing from law enforcement. One of the sessions uh, that, we did, that, I, that I really instigated um, after watching Ferguson, Missouri burn, because I said, you know, man, if, if this happens in our district, in, in any of the cities in West Michigan, what a tragedy. Because those types of events can scar a neighborhood, a community for decades. I mean, you know, the, the riots in Grand Rapids in 67 are still, you know, kind of talked about. Same in Detroit. And so I said, what can we do to try and prevent something like that happening, where you have an officer involved, death, where, where, where a citizen is, is, is killed by an officer. And because, you know, when you've got a, a, a tense relationship already, that is just the right spark to make things explode. So I went around and met with all of the uh, law enforcement, the police departments in the district that have large cities. And I said, what is your plan? And, and we, we actually started this with, with the Alpac in Grand Rapids. And we said, okay, City of Grand Rapids Police Department, what's your plan for an officer involved shooting? And lo and behold, it was very surprising, especially to the community representatives, that they, the police department had really given a lot of thought, not just recently, but, but for years. They had procedures and protocols of how they would handle it, and they were actually even doing some new ones. They had just ag agreed that the Michigan State Police would handle any officer involved incident to take uh, any co perceived conflict of interest off the table because they're not investigating their own, so they'd give it to the state police. Uh, but that's their job, and they were already giving forethought to how to handle the situation. Uh, but one thing that did come out of that session, even though the police had already had procedures and protocols, was the relationship, building a strong relationship with the community. Because the Grand City Grand Rapids has a, a community relations commission, a lot of cities do. But when you started listing the names, uh, they were all people, you know, with all due respect, that were in their 50s and, and, and 60s. It was, it was all old guard type people. And what's going on today with social media? Who's on that? Teens, 20-year-olds. They can spread the message lightning quick. They can reach 100, 1,000 people. So, you know, the, the ministers and the pastors at the large churches, God bless them, they can reach a, a 500 people, 1,000 people. But that's, they're not always reaching that young group. And so it was something the police had, the police chief had a good relationship with all those ministers and had a good relationship with all those community representatives that were, you know, of our vintage and higher. But were they reaching those, those influencers who, are, who have a lot of Twitter followers and a lot of friends on Facebook? They can identify those folks. They should be inviting them in before an incident, just like they should be inviting the ministers and the other community representatives in beforehand talking about what are the police procedures and protocols, why the police are doing what they're doing, so that if an incident looks like it might be brewing, those folks who've been briefed can come out to the community and say, hey, hey, hold on, let the police do their business, here's why they're doing what they're doing. For example, you know, it, a body, a, a, a dead body who's been you know, a victim of a shooting might lay in the street for hours at a time. The community perceives that as disrespectful. Why is that dead body not being taken care of? You know why? Law enforcement? It's a crime scene. We don't want to disrupt the crime scene. And, if it, and so that's why. So the community perceives it as disrespect. Law enforcement thinks they're doing their job. That's what you, you know, you got to get that message out that, and frankly, here's another one. A lot of times police officers around a dead body will uh, be, look, you know, amongst themselves might be look, joking or smiling or laughing. You know what that is? That's not disrespect, actually. That's gallows humor. You see it with soldiers, you see, and you certainly see it in law enforcement. The, if they didn't laugh and joke, not about the body, but about whatever, they would go crazy. And, but they're, now, they are instructed not to do that because it does look bad. But frankly, that's a human behavior, a very human behavior. So getting these issues out and getting some more understanding about them is helpful. So having the, the, the leaders in law enforcement reaching out to the 
community and a variety of community members, the younger members of the, of the community, the, the guys that are on the afternoon radio talk shows and, and public access shows, the media, getting them to understand what they do and why they do it in advance, not in a crisis, is very, very important. So that's something that I've uh, been going around and meeting with them on to make sure that they're, they're up on this and that they're doing these things, doing that kind of outreach and not just hunkering down. And because we don't want to see uh, one of those types of incidents happen in our, in our community. Um, uh, because, you know, really it is something that we can be proactive. Now, it's, it's not a guarantee that something bad isn't going to happen, but at least we're doing, trying to do something proactive to prevent it. Uh, some of the areas that also community it, itself can be engaged in, in preventing crimes uh, in working is, one is in the violent crime area. You know, South Haven, you're not up there, candidly, uh, with where like Muskegon Heights or Grand Rapids or Lansing or Benton Harbor is. But in these bigger uh, cities or cities which have a violent crime issue, what we are finding is the community can play a role in, in addressing the violent crime. Because most of the shootings are done by 0.5% of the population, less than half a percent uh, is involved in the shootings. The average citizen, the average person walking out is not going to really be a victim of, of gun violence. But it's, it's, it's that young person between the ages of 18 to 26, roughly, uh, who is most likely to be a victim, especially if one of their friends or relatives has been a shooting victim or involved in shooting themselves. Because what you get is you get retaliation and all these. They're all connected. And you get uh, people, mostly shootings aren't related to the drug trade. Less than 20% of, of, of those uh, relate to drugs. It's not, it's, it's just beefs, stupid stuff. Someone put up a picture on Facebook or on Instagram uh, disrespecting me or, or, or hitting on my girl or, 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 or said something about our neighborhood or something. It's disrespect and they live by a different code and it's it's very rational behavior these aren't people that are out of control these are this is very rational behavior they, they're living by the code of the street they even say oh, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a warrior I'm a soldier and but it's also rational behavior because I've got a gun because he's got a gun and if I don't protect myself he's gonna kill me and I'm gonna kill him before he kills me I mean so this is going on so understanding this dynamic so there was a professor who did a lot of research in this to address the violent crime in Boston about 30 years ago, 25 years ago, called the Project Ceasefire. Uh, his name was David Kennedy at John Jay University in New York. And I read about it and, 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 and where it's been successful in other cities. And it would be something, I know the city of Kalamazoo is very interested in doing this and would love to get the, the funding to do this. Um, where you bring in, with law enforcement, but you bring in community members uh, from those neighborhoods and says, who, who are, they're tired. We're tired of being terrorized. We're tired of getting shot. We're tired of having our children and our grandchildren getting shot or being afraid of getting shot, walking to school or walking down the street. And so you pull, and, and, and law enforcement knows who the, who the bad guys are and who the, who the violent guys are. And so they can, these groups, they're not organized gangs. You know, the more, the more sophisticated the criminal, the less likely they are to be violent. And so, but these violent groups, calling them in, or if they won't come, some of the representatives and saying, look, the neighborhood, the community, we're tired of it. We're not going to put up with it anymore. Law enforcement, we're tired of it. We're not going to put up with it anymore. So the next, so cease fire. Put down your guns. Truce. If the next, there's next another shooting, we're going to crack down on that group. We're, and, and if we can, we're going to take you federal, and you're going to be sent away for a long time if, if you violate this truce. And so this is something, and, but at the same time, we're going to try and give you some resources to get you a job, to get you on the right track, to get you out of this life. And so that's something that uh, we're really interested in trying to do in some of the cities here in our district. It's called Project Ceasefire. Uh, but again, we're something where the community can come in and be proactive in preventing crime. Another one is, I met, again, I mentioned prison and reentry. There is a community component to that. And, and it's, it goes from employers to what's called banning the box, where you might have your first application form says, hey, do you have a felony? Check the box, yes, boom, <coughs> scratch. That goes right into the trash can. No, maybe that felony occurred 25 years ago. Maybe that person's completely rehabilitated. Maybe it has nothing at all to do with the job that you're looking for them to do. So just not having it as an automatic disqualifier because someone has a, a record. Because if they can't get a job, guess what? They're gonna go back to committing crimes. I'm not saying give prisoners uh, 
an advantage over people who've kept their, 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 their lives clean, but at least don't automatically disqualify them from employment. And likewise, embracing members. I mean, this is for same for churches as well as families. I mean, embracing people who are coming out of prison uh, as you know, brothers and sisters again and giving them a chance at redemption and not ostracizing them and treating them like pariahs because they, had, they committed a crime and, and, uh, and screwed up. Because if we don't, and if they're going to continue to be alienated from society, they're going to act like they're alienated from society and commit crimes again. So this is something, again, where a community uh, can step up and, 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 and help uh, this cause. Um, I'll give you some numbers. I mean, over 2 million people are behind bars in America. 95% of those prisoners are going to be released. 10,000 ex-prisoners are released from American state and federal prisons each week. 10,000 a week. Over 650,000 ex-offenders are released each year. And the dollars, for those of you who are, who are uh, fiscal, uh, you know, fiscally interested, the, Bureau, the Federal Bureau of Prisons spends $6.5 billion. Nationally, the U.S. spends $74 billion a year on federal, state, and local corrections. And I mentioned the average of $30,000 to incarcerate a year. So, and you compare that to what it costs to educate. We spend less than half of that on, on education. So, you know, the costs of reentry failure are extremely high. Uh, society and economic uh, costs. We get more crime. As I said, we get more victims. We get more burdens on the system. Uh, and, and these folks aren't paying taxes when they're in prison. And they're not contributing. So, uh, and you get broken families and children in poverty, and then you get another cycle, right? Another generation. So, I mean, this to me, this is an area where we really need to make some changes in the United States uh, so that we don't keep making those same mistakes over and over again. Uh, we just really need to take that head on. Uh, so, uh, I would love to give, you know, the, the, the cheery, you know, happy, lucky speech, uh, but it's not my uh, duty and my job right now where, I, where I've got to give you the, you know, the, the, the news. But the good news is, like I said when I started, you've got really good people, both in law enforcement and in these prosecutor's offices, working really hard, and they're really good at what they do, and we take our jobs very seriously, uh, and we love it. Mm -hmm.